I'm very excited to introduce our next uh, guest. Um, uh, his name is Rick Doblin. Um, Rick is the founder and executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, otherwise known as MAPS, which is developing legal context for the beneficial use of psychedelics as prescription medicines. And he's going to tell us so much more um, in terms of like how it's been used or how it is being used um, for healing, for understanding trauma, for helping people um, expand consciousness. Um, and then again, Rick is somebody who had this vision, I think, 30, 40 years ago, and has been steadfast advocate for the benefits of psychedelics and in healing. And so, Rick, it's so good to have you back with us. Oh, sir, and thank you for this uh, opportunity to talk with you and the others. I really appreciate it. I'm really glad to talk with you. Cool. So I know there's so much going on, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if we can cover everything, but um, could you give us a, just a little bit of the state of where everything is in terms of the MDMA um, process and in terms of the potential for legalization of, of um, MDMA as a, as, a, as, as, a, as a support for healing PTSD? Yeah. So um, we're now 35 years into this struggle. So I started MAPS in 86. Um, I first did MDMA in 82. Um, I first worked with a PTS, PTSD patient in 84. I spoke about mm. that in my TED talk, if people are interested. Yeah. So I knew from that point that MDMA was great for PTSD. And it took us from um, 86 to 92 with five protocols rejected from the FDA, from Harvard, UC San Francisco, elsewhere, all because of uh, supposed neurotoxicity. But in mm. 1992, we got the first approvals for a phase one dose response safety study. That okay. took us through much of the 90s. And then in 1999, we did the first MDMA PTSD study, started that in Spain. And the heartbreak there was that then it got shut down by the Madrid Anti-Drug Authority for political reasons. Wow. Um, actually, the National Institute on Drug Abuse sent some of the neurotoxicity researchers to Spain to speak in public uh, about how dangerous this drug was. And that gave the uh, Madrid Anti-Drug Authority the rationale to shut the study down. In 2000 is when we were able to um, start planning for the FDA. 2000 was the first, 2001, we got FDA approval. It took us till almost 2004 to get IRB, Institutional Review Board approval. And then it took us till um, November 29th, 2016 for what's called the end of phase two meeting. So that was 30 years. Uh, wow. Where we had done enough studies in phase two to help us figure out how to design phase three. And was the concern, and that happened because there was the concern for for health, like health concern, or the political concerns, or do you think all of it? The, the reason all that happened, all of it, happened, all of it. also fundraising. So you know, we've raised about 115 million in donations in these um, 35 years, but you know, it, we've been slowed down by the need to rely on philanthropy. Um, yeah. There was regulatory problems, political problems, um, also scientific. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we needed to figure out in phase two, what is the treatment itself? What are the doses yeah. that we use? How do we deal with the double blind challenge? Um, right. What's the patient population? Um, right. Certain kinds of PTSD or not? What's the inclusion exclusion criteria? So all of that took us all this time. And then we got approval to go to phase three at this end of phase two meeting. Um, we negotiated with FDA for eight months and then in July, we came to agreement on the protocol design and everything else we were going to need to show them for approval in phase three. And then in August of 2017, we got breakthrough therapy. And then okay. in 2018 is when we started our first phase three study. Oh, wow. Then we just published now May 10th uh, in Nature Medicine of 2021, the results of our first phase three study, which okay. were outstanding. And, and, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of the results in a second, but I'll just give you the timeline first. Um, sure, sure. So we did, um, the results were so outstanding, actually, that um, they meet the criteria that FDA has established for approval of a drug for prescription use on the basis of one phase three study. But mm. we applied to the FDA to go forward and they said no. They, it's controversial, it's MDMA, it's a schedule one drug, uh, they want to see more safety data. So we are going to go forward with our second phase three study, which is underway now. And there's a process called interim analysis, which mm. means that you can look at the data before the study is done. In our case, we have to do two 100-person um, phase three study. 
The first one was 90 people instead of 100 because of COVID, and we came to agreement on FDA to end at 90. The second one will be 90 subjects. And the interim analysis is when 60% or 60 of the 100 have reached their primary outcome measure, but all 100 have been enrolled. Okay. And so that's to give you a sense as to, are you likely to get statistical significance? And do right. you need any subjects to add? And chances are, we're not gonna need to add any subjects. And so, but that's the next big point we will know with that interim analysis, if we're likely to succeed and make it into a medicine. That study will be done in October, 2022. And okay. then we take a couple months to analyze the data, submit it to FDA. And we think in the second half of 2023, we'll have FDA approval for marketing MDMA for PTSD as a prescription medicine. Wow. We're starting in Europe and, and you said you're in Europe right now. So, yeah. in, so yeah. um, we've got nine sites in six countries in Europe, the Czech Republic, um, Portugal, Norway, the Netherlands, Germany, and um, England, which is no longer part of uh, Europe. Right. Um, and we've got a sites in Berlin, Hamburg, uh, Maastricht, wow. um, uh, Leiden, um, Lisbon, uh, Prague, and uh, King's College in London, uh, and um, in Norway, Oslo, Norway. And they're all ready to go. They're, they're moving forward. We, we've started a, um, the training of therapists in Europe. So we think that Europe will be one year behind and we'll have okay. approval in 2024, the end of that in Europe. And we're also negotiating and working with um, the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Authority in Australia, um, in Brazil, we've already done a phase two study. Wow. So we're really thinking about globalization. Yeah. And, you know, then we wanna do, um, if we succeed in adults, which is defined by the FDA as 18 years or older, then we are required to do pediatric studies, which means adolescents with PTSD, 12 to 17 year olds. Oh. If that works, we have to go down to seven to 11 year olds. And Whoa. there's good reasons to think that it will work. And also, you know, the, the big um, rhetoric about the drug war is, oh, we got to protect the kids from drugs and they have to be, um, the brains are still developing. And, so right. it's a difference. First off, I don't buy that argument. But secondly, it's a different story if somebody has got PTSD, if they're right. a kid traumatized, their brains are changed by the PTSD. And the MDMA yeah. doesn't change brains in a bad way. It changes brains in a good way. Um, yeah. Opens up uh, channels of love and things like that. So um, that that's going to be one of the um, next steps would be adolescent studies. Also group therapy studies. We're trying to mm. understand mm -hmm. that. Uh, we've got some funding and... Um, approval we're moving forward at the Portland VA to start with mm -hmm. veterans. Um, I do see, by the way, a um, question in the chat that yeah. has the primary outcomes in your study. So let me explain. Um, the primary outcome measure is called the CAPS, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale CAPS 5. So it means that's the fifth revision of it. It's been developed by the Boston Veterans Administration it's been around for quite a long time. It's been translated into most languages, or not most, but many languages of the world. It's the gold standard for evaluating PTSD symptoms all over the world. It's the one outcome measure required by <clears throat> FDA and European Medicines Agency. And it's about an hour long interview by trained raters. And we do have a, a pool of over 20 of these CAPS raters. Every month they review a same videotape and we make sure their scores are similar that is called inter-rater reliability they're randomly assigned to the next person that needs an outcome measure which is really um breaks the cycle of the raters knowing where the people are in the study or even which group they're in all right so that's the outcome measure now the outcomes from the point of view of fda and european medicines agency what you need to do is have what's called statistically significant differences between your control group and your experimental group. Mm -hmm. So we have to have, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, um, statistically significant differences between therapy without MDMA versus therapy within, with MDMA. Right. So in a sense, what we're looking at is subtracting the therapy and it's just what does the MDMA do by itself? Mm -hmm because that's the main difference between the two groups, therapy without MDMA, therapy with MDMA. Right. You have to get statistical significance. And, you know, we had such outrageous statistical significance, uh, what's called the p-value, the probability, 
is uh, if it's statistically significant, it's 0.05, which means it's a one in 20 chance that mm. what the differences that you found were due to random factors and not to what your intervention is. Mm. So if it's that low of a chance, it's called statistically significant. And you need to do two of those. So when you think about it, one in 20 by the first phase three study, one in 20 by the second phase three study, that means one in 400, 20 times 20. So you have a one in 400 chance of it being random factors. And if so, you get the drug approved. Now that's pretty um, not easy. A lot of studies are not statistically significant, but what we got, the, the FDA has another level called 0 0.001, which is one in a thousand. Wow. And that's where if you get that, then you might qualify for getting the drug approved on the basis of one robust, very persuasive phase three study. Wow. So it's harder than two independent phase three studies, which is one in 400. This would be one in a thousand. What we uh, got was 0 0.0001, which is one in 10,000. Wow. So there is no chance practically that what we found is not due to MDMA. Right, right, right. It, it's pretty amazing. So, but statistical significance is not the, while it's the important thing that the FDA looks at, um, there's other ways to look at the data. And one of the ways that we mostly look at it is whether people still have a diagnosis of PTSD. Mm -hmm. So you could say, have we cured PTSD? You know, you can have clinically significant reductions of PTSD and still have PTSD. Mm -hmm. So what we showed is in phase two, in our control group, which was people who got therapy with no MDMA or people that got therapy with low dose MDMA in our failed effort to try to figure out how to do a successful double blind study. But we lumped those two groups together. 23% no longer had PTSD at the two month follow up. Now, these are severe, on average, chronic, treatment-resistant PTSD patients. We feel we have to work with the hardest cases. We enroll people that have previously attempted to kill themselves. Many PTSD studies do not enroll those people because that would mm -hmm. be problematic if somebody commits suicide during your study. But we feel we've got to include them because if it doesn't work for the hardest people, why are we bothering to do it? So what we showed is 23% with therapy with no MDMA or low-dose MDMA no longer had PTSD at the two month follow up. Now wow. that's pretty good for therapy. For treatment resistant people, they had PTSD somewhere in the neighborhood of um, almost two decades, stuck with PTSD. Um, but when you add MDMA to the therapy- so That was 23% with just the therapy. Just the therapy, yeah. Okay. Yeah, when you add MDMA, it's 56%, no longer MDMA. Wow. Yeah, it's really, wow. really good. Now that's, all good for FDA, but the real question for insurance coverage, and that's what we need, because what we want to do is not just get this approved, we want to get it to treating patients. Right. And there's a lot of patients, this is labor intensive, it's a lot of therapy, it's 42 hours of therapy, wow. which is expensive, and it's a male-female team. It's not yeah. always male-female, but it's a two-person team. One eventually will be like a student intern working for no money to get their hours, but mm -hmm. so far it's been two therapists, okay. 42 hours. So the question from an insurance company perspective is, is it durable? Is it mm -hmm. worth paying this money? If the results last, the answer is yes. If the results fade, the answer is probably no. Right. So the 12 month follow-up, what we showed, and this I think is the most important point about our phase two data, is that it was now two thirds no longer had PTSD. And what that wow. means people keep getting better after there's no treatment from us at all. We stop uh, every intervention at the two month follow-up. All we do is see them again at the one year. Wow. And do this evaluation. So that was phase two. And that was what we presented to FDA. Now, our phase three study, our first phase three study, I'm happy to report, was even better than our phase two. Whoa, data. really? Yeah, even better. Now, part of it is- Better than two thirds. Yeah. Now, and we used a lot of new therapists. So actually we took our main therapist, Michael and Annie Mithofer, out of yeah. who'd done phase two. They did the most of the subjects. We had 107 subjects in phase two. Um, oh. They did um, almost half of them just by themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we had studies in Israel, Switzerland, Canada, and the United States, six different studies. Michael and Annie did the most of them. 
uh, I mean, and the most important ones. And we decided that if you could um, be criticized by saying this is because of these phenomenally uh, talented therapists, and that's why it's working. And Michael and Annie are also real, and we realized we got to train a new generation of therapists. We need thousands and thousands of new therapists. So we took Michael and Annie out of phase three and turned them full time into training new therapists. Hmm. So phase three was mostly new therapists, over 70 wow. of them, in 15 sites, two in Israel, two in Canada, and 11 throughout the United States. And what we showed was that at the two month follow up for the control group that got therapy without any MDMA, 32% of severe chronic PTSD patients um, no longer had PTSD mm -hmm. as compared to 23%. So the control group did better. Now you might think that's a problem because you know the better the control group does, the more, you know, is there still, you need a big right, difference. Right. What we showed is that at the two month follow-up, the group of the therapy with MDMA, two thirds no longer had PTSD. 32% so, versus two thirds, 66%. Yeah, wow. yeah. so we, we don't have the data yet from the one year follow up. Not everybody has hit that point. Mm -hmm. But what we anticipate is if it's similar to phase two, is more people will keep getting better. That you've taught yeah. people how to process their trauma. And that's really um, the main thing is that we're trying to help people heal themselves and to continue to heal themselves yeah. without the drug. So it's the opposite of a pharma drug. Right. Here you got a biological problem. Take this drug every day for the rest of your life. If you stop taking it, your problems come back. It's symptom control. Yeah. It doesn't get to the core of the problem. All right. So those are our, our outcomes. Now, there's also what's called effect size. And effect size is because um, you can have statistical significance with a very small effect. The larger numbers right. of subjects you have in your study you can find smaller, smaller and smaller differences and make them statistically significant because you wash out all the other factors. So the effect size is a way to try to um, equalize across studies. And so I'll just mm -hmm. say that in, our, in terms of effect size, what we showed is that the SSRI, Zoloft and Paxil, that got approved by the FDA for PTSD, they had an effect size that was like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Um, and an effect size of one means one standard deviation from the norm. So okay. that's considered very large, an effect size of one. And the FDA has approved drugs with like a 0 0.3, a 0 0.4, a 0 0.5. Those are small to medium, low medium effects. Wow. wow. We had um, two different ways to express our effect size. The effect size is um, what's called placebo subtracted. So the mm -hmm. first way was where we take, you compare the two groups, we take out basically the progress that the group that had therapy, that they made from the group that had therapy plus MDMA. So we had an effect size of 0.91, which was mm -hmm. a, a large effect size. It's phenomenal, but that's only for the MDMA. The within groups effect size of the people that got MDMA plus therapy was 2.1, two wow. standard deviations from the norm on average. And from a safety point of view, um, we had one woman try to kill herself during the study twice, actually. We had another mm -hmm. woman who had such severe ID, so suicidal ideation that she checked herself into a, a hospital, an inpatient, to avoid self-harm. Wow. Both of them, it turned out, were in the placebo group, not the MDMA group. Oh, uh, wow. So okay. we had nobody in the MDMA group try to kill themselves. Nobody tried to do self-harm. Um, and of the one-third that still has PTSD in our phase three studies, um, about... Uh, Two thirds of the remainder, remainder um, had what's called clinically significant reductions of PTSD symptoms, meaning their life was changed for the better, a lot fewer symptoms, but they still qualify for a diagnosis. Got it. Got if we could have given them a fourth session, maybe they would have been, yeah. or, or maybe at the 12 month follow up, they'll continue to get better on their own. All right, so now I see this other question about how does. <laughs> <laughs> so I see, sorry, we're both checking the chat. Yeah, no, no, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And, and what, then, actually, what, what actually makes it, yeah, so what actually, as far as you can tell, ma makes that huge difference between 32% and 67%? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me also say that the third question that I see below is when patients are on antidepressants, do potential interactions exclude them from MDMA treatment? So th that's just sort of preliminary information. So the answer is yes. We require people to taper off of all their psychiatric medications to be in the study. Mm -hmm. And 
That's because these SSRIs, first off, they'll mute the effect of MDMA. But secondly, they also uh, mute people's emotional reactions. Mm -hmm. And we want people to be unmedicated. We want them to have more access to their emotions, even if it's difficult emotions, because mm -hmm. the MDMA will help them process different emotions. And if they're kind of mm -hmm. numbed out by psychiatric medications, it's not going to work as well. So we mm -hmm. do require people to um, withdraw from all their psychiatric medications. All right, mm -hmm. so then how does it work and what is the kind of therapy that we provide? So the therapy, we call it inner directed therapy. Mm, and that's great. It's based on a fundamental assumption that we all know that if you hurt your body, that we have mechanisms of repair that are below our level of conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. that our body has this self-healing mechanism. So our theory is that the psyche has something similar, that mm -hmm. there's kind of an inner healing intelligence. And what it does when there's a membrane between the conscious and the unconscious or the conscious and the subconscious, we all know that that's weakened, uh, made more permeable at night when we dream or when we meditate, or, or when we do various different things, this kind of flow to awareness. So there is this membrane, and psychedelics, in different ways, they kind of make more things emerge to awareness. They, they take mm. off some of these, um, either your ego identification from the classic psychedelics, or the reduction of fear in the amygdala, that MDMA reduces activity in the amygdala. More things come up. And where the inner healing intelligence comes in is that we believe that there's an order for what emerges that mm -hmm. we do not consciously know. We don't call ourselves the guides. The therapists are not the guides. We're not, we don't know where people need to go. Mm. They know where they need to go. They don't even know consciously where they need to go. I mean, one preparation for a psychedelic experience is you do all sorts of things about what you want to accomplish, what your goals are, what you hope to gain. And then right before you start your psychedelic uh, session, you throw that out and you just give it all up and whatever happens, happens. Right, but there's right, some right. value in the preparation, but then you let it go. And so this idea of this inner healing intelligence is that our mission as therapists, sitters, supporters, midwives, even you could say, is that we help people express what's emerging either in their bodies, their thoughts or their emotions. And one of the main books on trauma is called uh, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Yeah. And uh, amazingly, just to say about how people are interested in trauma these days, um, he published that book six years ago. Mm. And last week, it was the number one New York bestseller for wow. combined print and e versions of a book. Wow. Number one, published wow. six years ago. So people are being really sensitized to trauma at the base of yeah. depression, anxiety, substance abuse, so much racism, prejudice, all, all of this. So what we're basically saying is that the body keeps the score. A lot of this trauma is expressed in the body. And to give you one quick example, I worked with a, a German um, psychiatrist this long ago. And during the experience, his arm became paralyzed under MDMA. And he said, um, this is terrible. You know, I might need to go to the hospital. And we're like, no, this is not nerve damage. This has nothing to do with that. This is some psychosomatic thing. And over the course of um, a couple hours, we heard a story. And the story was that he and his mother and his siblings were at the deathbed of their father. And they had to decide whether to take him off life support. And he was the doctor. And he had to, they agreed to do that. And he signed this order. The problem mm -hmm. was he said he hated his father. And so wow. this was this conflict. Did he kill his father? Did he not? And as he explored this under MDMA, and it took a couple hours, and he realized that his mother had wanted that, his uh, siblings had wanted that, it probably was what his father wanted to. He didn't kill his father. Feeling came back to his arm, and then he was totally fine. No paralysis, wow. nothing. It was completely a psychosomatic. So when people's stuff emerges in their body, we encourage them to express it, to experience it or shaking or, or whatever, or in their memories or in their emotions to mm. express it. So that's where it's called inner directed therapy. And in an eight hour session where our sessions last eight hours, we give an initial dose and then two hours later, roughly we give half the initial dose. The first MDMA session is 80 milligrams followed by 40. 
The second is usually 120 followed by 60, and the third is usually 120 followed by 60. Although people can keep at the lower doses if they want to, and their therapists okay. agree. So there is that degree, and that the supplemental dose is optional as well. But in the course of an eight-hour session, around half the time, people's eyes are closed. They're listening to music. They're having kind of a um, what in um, it's called imaginal exposure in a way. In their imagination, they're going to the trauma, but they're going to all sorts of other things. It's metaphorical. It's poetic. It's beautiful storytelling. People are basically telling themselves the story of their life and rewriting the story. Wow. In, in many cases. And wow. of, around half the time that's happening, the other half of the time they're talking to the therapists. That's contrasted to psilocybin or LSD, where around 80 or 90 percent people are internal and the rest of the time they're talking to the therapist. So they're rewriting the story. So can you help me understand that? So let's say I was in a war zone or I was in a difficult place and I saw some child get killed or saw some tragedy and it really impacted me. Um, or I felt like my parent abused me at this young age. And so if I go back with the MDMA and I'm, I'm in a more relaxed place, I can see it more clearly. I have this story that this happened to me. How, and, and the therapist isn't telling them to change that story, right? The therapist is just holding space. What are you noticing inside? What are you, what are you sensing? I, I, I get the sense that there's inquiry. What does it mean, do you feel like, to rewrite that story? Yeah. Is it... Okay. Could you yeah. help us understand so, um, that? Yeah, that, that's a great, great question. So the, the first thing is that um, by reducing the fear uh, associated with the memory, people have a better recall of the traumatic experience. Mm. So okay. people remember their story in more detail. I mean, one of the best examples was um, a firefighter who was in a fire where the roof collapsed and around eight firefighters got killed. And he was one of the ones that got out alive. And under the influence of MDMA, he said, I thought I remembered this fire and what happened, but whole big chunks of it I had forgotten. And so no. first off, the, the reduction of fear makes it so that the memories are more accessible to people. No. Now, they're not changing the memories, but often what happens through this oxytocin release, so MDMA, so this gets back in a way you could say to how does it work? There's a release of uh, oxytocin, of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, oxytocin, which is the hormone of love and nurturing and nursing mothers and orgasm and love and connection and self-acceptance. But often people rewrite the story in the sense that they can understand that it wasn't their fault what happened mm -hmm. to them. People blame themselves a lot. Mm -hmm. And also they sometimes develop empathy for the person who was doing the traumatizing of them. Wow. They can see them as wounded themselves mm -hmm. and they have a better sense of it. And the other thing that they're able to do is place this event firmly in the past. So the mm -hmm. thing about PTSD is it's never really in the past. It's coloring every moment in the present. It might about to happen again. Every noise reminds you of it, things, things like that. So that there's a process called fear extinction and memory reconsolidation. So this will really get to the, to the final step in answering your question. Right. So what memory reconsolidation is. So first off, what is memory? Yeah, what is memory? <laughs> it used to be that we thought that memory was um, you had a book in your shelf that was the memory. You know, you pull the book down, you read it, that's your memory, and you put the book back. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we understand that it's not like that at all. There's a memory, there's like a book, you pull it down, but in order to store the book again, you have to reprint the entire book. So that's okay. called memory reconsolidation. Okay. All right, and that explains how people's memories change over time. You know, memory is not 100% reliable of what actually happened. Right. You know, we change things. So in this reconsolidation though, what's happening is that because the fear has been reduced of the memory, because the amygdala activation has been reduced, the prefrontal cortex activation is increased from MDMA, the connection between the hippocampus and the amygdala where we put memories into long stor storage is increased by MDMA. What, what happens when you do the reconsolidation, also I should say that the oxytocin promotes new neural connections. So you are mm -hmm. actually rewiring your brain in these pro-social new routes of memory. So the memory reconsolidation means that if you've looked from a position of peace and self-acceptance 
at a mm. traumatic memory and you've experienced and expressed it, it no longer has this charge that uh. it's overwhelming that you can't handle it. And it no longer has this sense that it's always happening right now, that you get a sense of safety, you're safe with the therapists. Um, then when you reconsolidate the memory, you have got a better hold on the episodic memory, the episode of what happened. But the emotional connection, the emotional context, the emotional valence connected mm -hmm. to that memory has now swapped from this is terrifying to I've integrated, this is peaceful, and it's in the past. So what that means is then the next time you remember it, because again, rewriting your story doesn't mean changing that it never, making mm -hmm. it like it never happened. It means that the next time you remember it, you remember the episode even clearer, but what's associated, the emotional content that's associated with and the temporal location of the trauma is in the past and you've handled it. So that's how you're rewriting your story. Got it. So the, the in, in part, the trauma experience, if I understand right, is, is continues because we're replaying a story about that experience. Yes. And the MDMA helps to release that sense of, of continual storytelling so that we can actually see more clearly and from that scene more clearly um, tell a different story that, that is more conducive to our well-being. Yeah, and, and another aspect of that story is that people are not trustworthy. You know, I need right. to be scared of people. People have done this horrible thing to me. Now you can have PTSD from natural disasters. It's not always about people, but most right. of the trauma, I mean, people, most of the trauma is about uh, self-inflicted or no, human inflicted trauma. Okay. Sadly. So the story is people can't be trusted. Um, I will right. never find love. I'm always gonna be isolated. I always have right. to be suspicious. And so that filter is how you encounter every new person. Right, it, right, right, right. So, so that that part of the story is, is removed. And now you can say, well, that was specific to that time and place. Not everybody is going to be hurting me. I can gather information. I can start to trust myself to decide, is this person OK or not? Um, I see a good question here, which was, yeah. um, does this work for ambiguous trauma history without specific memories? There, yeah. There's an interesting point about that, which is the answer is it can, yes, um, because you are you can sometimes deal with just emotions without a story. You don't always need the story. Let, let's say a lot of times body sensations, you don't even right. you get the story, but you're like a weather vane for, um, you know, lightning rod. The, the emotions have hit you and they go through you. And if you resist its friction, if you don't, it goes through you. But it's, it can be like these emotions without a story. Wow, and, and so wow. you can have it now. One of the things that that's very interesting about this ambiguous treatment trauma history has to do with racial trauma. What do you okay. do when the entire society is racist? I mean, not every single person, but that you live in a sure. constant sort of uh, microaggressions. You could say just in a, a mm -hmm. sense of constantly being on guard. So we've had a problem enrolling people with uh, color, people of color, with PTSD. And, one and, of the, and this PTSD would be longer la or like continual over time versus a, a set event. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they're, they're impacted by it that, that you know, they, they have the same kind of um, symptoms. But one of the things about the CAPS-5 that we don't really like is that you have to have what's called an index trauma, which means okay. that you have to have one trauma that you speak to. And every time that you're evaluated for your symptoms, it's how much are your symptoms related to that index trauma? So we recently have four um, patients of color that had PTSD, had all the symptoms, but we could not enroll them in the study because oh, they had this maybe. ambiguous trauma history because uh, they couldn't anchor it on one particular trauma. Oh, uh, that's too bad. There's a in a lifetime of trauma. And so there, there's something flawed in the instrument, but again, yeah. We have to use the gold standard incident. We have uh, instrument. We have to communicate with FDA, European Medicines Agency. We have to use that. But it can work because you can just deal with the emotions without the story. Um, wow. I see this idea is does MDMA pull the punitive narrative away from the experience? Um, often that's part of, yes, the answer is yes. And that's part of the um, enhanced activity in the prefrontal cortex where you think logically. 
So yeah. children have a sense that, um, you know, if their parents divorce, it's from them. You know, it's mm -hmm. their fault. Yeah, or if yeah. you're being punished, you did it something to deserve it. Or you're being sexually yeah. abused. You know, people tend to, it's easier to blame yourselves than to blame other people. Totally, particularly when you're young. Yeah. So yeah. this idea of seeing it from your adult ID eyes with the fear mm -hmm. reduction, you can often get over this. I'm the one that did this. I'm the problem. Mm -hmm. I must mm -hmm. have deserved it. I led this person on. I got raped, but it was my fault because I wore this or that. Or, you know, the society kind of reinforces those kind of messages too. Yeah. So that is the goal that the now there are lessons that people need to learn. Maybe they did do some things that were provocative or that were too risky for something. Let's just say not provocative, but too risky. Um, yeah, you can say, okay, I did that and now I can um, work. So, so for example, just to give a sense, one woman that um, I worked with, um, was, it was a date rape situation. It was a horrible situation with a date rape. And so, um, the, the, and therefore she couldn't trust anybody because she voluntarily went out with this guy. And I asked her at one point during the MDMA therapy, you know, what did you like about him? And she immediately mm. vomited. <laughs> Whoa. And, and then she said, um, I liked the fact that he was kind to a dog. Mm. And so once she was able to do that, because she then said, okay, not everybody that's kind to animals is going to be kind to people. And she was able to, in that way, recover her critical ability to evaluate new people in her life. Mm -hmm. so that was she was able to um yeah pull the punitive narrative it See, wasn't her fault and and she can right. evaluate where she went wrong um and also uh jim brunson says it, it seems that mdma therapy would be great to help people approaching their death any plans for that application um we did do a study with people that are um life-threatening illnesses scared of dying and that was really good results but the harder thing and the thing that i've done a couple times and this is um a long time ago, but I've worked with people several days before they died with MDMA. When they were dying of cancer, they are on heavy opiates. They're basically tranquilized. You know, they're, you're not hardly present at all. And the opiates don't remove all the pain and, and it's, it's a terrible situation. When you add MDMA on top of it, now these were very risky, um, initially risky situations because nobody knew the drug-drug interactions. You're taking a cocktail, you know, 10 different drugs. Right, right. And what is MDMA going to do? And But these people were dying anyway. We all decided to take the risk. And what it turns out is that MDMA synergizes with the opiates, meaning that you get better pain control from the opiates alone. The MDMA plus opiates give you better pain control. Plus, MDMA is a stimulant. It wakes you up. I mean, that's why people take it and dance all night. So the opiates are tranquilizers, depressants. They, they make you sleepy. So the MDMA combined with the opiates makes people have better pain control and it wakes them up and they're open hearted. Wow. And so I've right. seen the most miraculous situations of um, people saying goodbye to their loved ones over a couple hours of a session right before they died. But the reason that, that this hasn't happened yet, that there are no active plans for using MDMA in a hospice setting is that there's so many potential medical complications, multiple drugs that are being given. People are um, already, you know, seriously weakened in their health. Um, but I think it's going to be one of the best uses of MDMA will be in the hospice setting for people that are very much uh, near the end of life. And they want to get a, a different perspective. And it sounds like what happens with the trauma is that trauma solidifies a moment. It solidifies something in terms of like it, 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 we continue to live it and feel like it's real. And then the more that we can go back into that and see that it's not happening right now. Yeah. And it, it has different components in it that we might not have seen. Because somebody had asked, how do we know which story is true? Oh, yes, yes. Let me ask, answer that oh, question. That's yeah, please. So this is maybe um, more, uh, there, there's a philosophical element to this as well. But what, what I want to, so, so, for example, somebody recently that I was uh, talking to remembered um, sexual abuse from a, um, a teacher in junior mm -hmm. high and processed a lot of emotions. 
So is that a true memory or not? So the first distinction that I want to make is that when we're talking about therapy, whether it's symbolically true or actually true in the sense that that memory is of something that actually took place, it doesn't matter. So that something can be useful without being true. So these memories that they're in the therapeutic context, we treat these memories and these emotions as if they're true. And we okay. ask people to explore them, to experience them, to express what's going on, to work through it, whether it's true or not. So is it true in a legal context? Can someone bring charges, for example? against this person for sexual abuse on the basis of kind of a recovered memory that happened under MDMA. As I've already indicated, we know that people's memory recall for trauma is increased under MDMA. Yeah. Whether it's true is um, a different question than whether it's effective. And so since our goal is to help people, we don't have to belabor that question. Now, you can try to look and get verifying evidence. So let's just say that a lot of people talk about past lives, Mm -hmm. you know, and you have a memory of a past life. Is that really true? Or is there um, symbolically, it's true, it's relating to a conflict. And then we can get into this whole question about collective unconscious. And is there such a thing? So even if you have a memory of a past life that might actually, I believe, could be potentially recovered a memory from the collective unconscious, let's say, Mm -hmm. is it your past life? To what sense do you own it? You know, is that your soul or is it just some human's past life right. as part of this collective humanity and you're tuning into it because it's related right. to what you're doing? Yeah. And, and we hear about so many people who are kings and queens and princes and princesses and, you know, not a lot of peasants in past lives and stuff. So <laughs> part of it is like wishful thinking. But, but I think the answer again for is it true or not, it's a, a different level of analysis. Okay. And from a therapeutic perspective, from a personal growth perspective, we don't have to know that. But I would say that we know that our memory is not always accurate. Yeah. That we can remember things differently than they have actually happened. That's through this memory reconsolidation process. So I would say that you shouldn't automatically assume that what people are remembering is 100% true. Got it. But we say that about our memory as well. But I would say there might even be a bit more likelihood, a higher percentage of truth under the influence of uh, MDMA or psychedelic because Mm -hmm. it does enhance this kind of memory recall. But even then, a lot of times it's too painful, symbolic. And then then when you're really getting successful in the therapy, it condenses from symbolic to your own life. Mm -hmm. So I I think that's uh, something for the philosophy. It it sounds like it's it 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 um it reveals something the fact that that memory is there or that experience is there i distrust men or i distrust women or i i can't stand this it's symbolic of something which may be true to that memory or might be true as just a symbol of something and the mdma kind of helps us go back to that and release some of that story and see a little more clearly and by seeing a little more clearly, our nervous systems can kind of recalibrate in a different way that allows that to be in the past and isn't continuing to experience it in the present. Yeah, yeah, that's a very great way to say it. I'll just say that in a holotropic breathwork experience, yeah. you know, where I was trained by Stan Groff and was in the first group that became certified holotropic breathwork, I had this ex- memory experience of, of being in the Inquisition and having my oh. legs in splints and people were hammering my legs to break the bones in my legs. Wow. wow. Now, I had to work through that. It was horrifying. It was painful. Was it true? Was that a past life of mine or not? I have no idea. And I, I'm not really engaged much in that question. Was it true or not? I yeah. can see that it relates to my current life where I feel like, you know, when I was 18, um, you know, I was a draft resistor, planning to go to jail yeah. for that. I, I identified as a counterculture drug using criminal. <laughs> that was sort of my self identification. Um, so I feel, uh, you know, and I was Jewish and I was raised on stories of the Holocaust. So this idea mm-hmm. of being a persecuted minority for your ideas that go against, you know, mainstream uh, ideas that resonated with me. So whether I was actually in the Inquisition and, mm-hmm. or not, 
for me, those are questions that um, I don't know that they matter all that much, really. Yeah, got they it. Affect therapy. How do you, so if it's true or not, is not really going to affect your approach to supporting people to experience it. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of general supportive yeah. approach. And do you feel like there are like MDMA is like a better intervention versus ketamine or better than uh, psilocybin or better than others? Or do you feel like that was just kind of the one area you're exploring now and anything well, that kind of helps to shift consciousness so you can see clearly is, is worth the, worth your exploration? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. And I see this other question. Somebody studied about ketamine. Yeah. So it depends what you mean by better. Um, the, the world's first use of a psychedelic for PTSD was a Dr. Bastians in the Netherlands, and he used LSD for concentration camp syndrome. He worked with wow. people in concentration camps. And there's a great book, if anybody wants to read it, called Shaviti, S-H-I-V-I-T-T-I, -T -T Shaviti of Vision. And it's an Israeli uh, Holocaust writer who went to Dr. Bastians for LSD therapy. And it's a description of his memories and several of his LSD trips. But LSD doesn't reduce the fear. It just reduces this, uh, it, it um, makes this conscious, subconscious, unconscious membrane more permeable. So it mm -hmm. helped bring more memories to the surface from this, and it helped them to experience and express it. But there was parts that were overwhelming. And my Israeli relatives knew him and knew that he was helped by LSD, but that he was still tormented in a bunch of different ways. It wasn't fully in the past. Wow, okay. So I, I do think that for, PTSD, that MDMA is the ideal drug. But there's a company called Mitocene today that we're working yeah. with, and various companies are talking to us about uh, partnering. And they want to do a study that would be one arm gets psilocybin for PTSD, mm -hmm. another arm gets MDMA for PTSD, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then a third arm would start with an MDMA session, then a psilocybin session, mm -hmm. and then either another psilocybin or another MDMA session. So the main thing to say is that um, what we're really about is psychedelic medicine. That's Got what it. our goal is, is to bring the, all these different drugs to psychedelic therapists so that they could use them and then they can customize the treatments for each person. Right. And they, you may start with MDMA, you may start with psilocybin, you may start with mescaline, which is very mm. warm as well. And mescaline is the classic psychedelic most similar chemically to MDMA, so a phenethylamine. It's the only psychedelic that's a phenethylamine, the only classic psychedelic that's a phenethylamine instead of a tryptamine. So I think that I do believe that MDMA is the best for PTSD, but even for PTSD, I think that, um, you know, people could benefit from a series of different drugs and ketamine as well. There's gonna be a ketamine PTSD study. I think ketamine has been made into a medicine in a very suboptimal way which means ketamine as a pharmacological treatment without psychotherapy. So S ketamine as right. made into a medicine by Johnson and Johnson's Bravado is developed without therapy. And I think it, it okay. means you, you, you it, it's profit maximizing rather than outcome maximizing. The right. effects don't last as long, they fade. You've got to um, take more ketamine. And if you need more therapy, that doesn't money go to the Johnson and Johnson, that goes to the therapists. But more and more right. ketamine clinics are providing MD, uh, are providing ketamine with therapy, so that's a good start. Right. But uh, but I would that think seems to be, yeah that there may can be say, other yeah. And can you say the importance of the therapeutic model? Is it is it allow people to integrate and digest and really understand? Um, yeah. Well, let, let me give you just another. Yeah, the therapeutic model. Um, several of the people in our study said, "I don't know why they call this ecstasy." Meaning uh, that it's not like you take a pill and your problems go away and everything's fine and you're loving the world. It's that the fear is reduced so much that now you can let all these traumatic memories into your awareness and you can let out these feelings and it can be quite scary. I think for people, if you want to see the best documentary ever made about MDMA assisted therapy for anything, it's called Trip of Compassion. It's on Vimeo, okay. Trip of Compassion. It's about three of our Israeli patients, and it's with English subtitles when it's in Hebrew, and a lot of it is in English. But you'll see people going through stuff that doesn't look fun. I mean, they're shaking, they're, they're screaming, they're, they're, right. they're struggling with stuff. So that I think what, what we're saying basically is that these are um, can be very difficult experiences, and the therapy component helps people to 
open up to it instead of resist it and be defensive. So Got the it. therapy gives you a sense of safety, a sense of support. It protects you from the outside world because you are increasingly um, not monitoring the environment for your survival. As I said before, around eight hours, half the time, more or less, people's eyes are closed, they're totally inward. I think that's one reason why a lot of um, people of color have not been comfortable doing this because you're defenseless. You have right. to have a basic sense of trust. The therapy, if you can create a safe environment, the therapeutic alliance with the uh, therapist that you feel safe enough, you can become more defenseless. Yeah, and, that's, that's and then great. also you're not so um, worried about being overwhelmed because the therapist right. will help you and support you. And, and then right. the integration process helps you put yourself together. We tell people that it's a two day experience. It's not mm -hmm. just you take MDMA for eight hours. The second day, you should have absolutely nothing to do. And it's for resting. We bring the therapist back for more integrative psychotherapy the next day. Now, I see this great question of when and where can we get this therapy? <laughs> so, um, we have phase three sites in um, Israel, Canada, and the United States. So you go to clinicaltrials.gov which is a website where everybody who's doing clinical research has to post their study. So clinicaltrials.gov. And there's a place where you put in the um, indication, put in PTSD, and then it says put in the drug or anything like that. You put in MDMA, and then you get a list of studies. Most of them are already done, but number 18 is our phase three study. And mm. when you go into that, that describes a bit of the protocol, the inclusion exclusion criteria, but it lists the cities that we have the studies in and the study coordinators in each of those cities wow. so that you can volunteer to be in the study. Now, half the people will get therapy without MDMA and the half the people will get therapy with MDMA. So wow. one of the things, and, and I've mentioned that 32% um, of the people that get therapy with, without any MDMA still get, no, don't have PTSD. Right. So it's not like you're getting nothing, but after the study is over, after the entire study is over, which could be a year or so for more, as I said, it'll all be over in October of 2022. Then we uncover the blind and everybody that had the therapy without MDMA can go through the study again for free oh, again wow. with MDMA. Oh. So there's That's a great. lag time there, but you have to do it. Now there's also what's called expanded access. That's mm -hmm. compassionate use. And so we are now approved by the FDA for 50 expanded access patients. That's where there's no control group. They're in cities where we don't have phase three sites, but that's where patients have to pay for it themselves. So oh, yeah. it's not offered on a compassionate basis. Because there's no control group, the FDA doesn't look at the data for efficacy, but they do want to see the data for, um, for safety. Got so it. there is, it's more expensive than normal treatments will be. But you can also go to clinicaltrials.gov, and we, you, I don't remember which number it is, but we have, um, you know, the expanded access up there, and we will be. None of the sites are open yet, but we're Rockville, Maryland is going to be the first one, probably in August, and then we're opening others. So there will be other opportunities for people to get help in that way. Right, and then right. if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can also put in psilocybin or depression or whatever, and you can see the oh, whole wow. range of studies That's where so cool. you want to apply. Now, there's another really good question of, from uh, Nick about the risks of re-traumatization. Mm -hmm. I've heard anecdotes of this happening in non-clinical recreational settings. It sounds like the therapeutic container is critically important here. Um, the answer is totally yes. Yeah, that, that, so just as a story I've often told, uh, this is now 15 years ago, two women approached us in the same week with uh, similar stories. One, both of them had taken MDMA at a rave. One woman said, I remembered prior sexual assault. I was with a bunch of friends. I knew that they didn't want to talk about anything that wasn't just fun. I stuffed down the feelings and it's months ago and now I feel worse. Mm. So that by, you know, she had sort of made her peace with this memory. It was sufficiently suppressed. It colored everything. But then under MDMA, you bring it to the surface. And if you're not ready to deal with it and then you try to suppress it, you can be yeah. re-traumatized. You can also be re-traumatized re if it's such a painful memory. So let me give another example of that. Well, let me, before I do that, I'll just say that another woman the same week said, I went to a rape, I took MDMA, I remembered prior sexual assault, I was with a girlfriend, we went off into the corner, we talked about it for an hour, I feel a lot better, and now I think maybe you should explore MDMA for PTSD. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of 
of, of very similar outcomes. But if you're open to it, you can um, make progress. If you suppress it, you're more likely. So now here's one story. We had someone who was in prison for murder and he had got out of prison and he wanted to volunteer to be in our study. Wow. And none of our therapists were willing except for one group, Marcella and Bruce in the Boulder study, they were willing to work with him. He'd been in prison for killing his father. His father mm -hmm. had physically and sexually abused him when he was young. At some point in time, they had a fight. The father had a gun. Um, they had to struggle over the gun. The gun went off accidentally and killed the father. And the, the son was in jail for a period of time. And then he got loose, get released. But he was saying he's traumatized by his early family history, also by being in jail. And he wanted to um, go into the therapy. So in the first MDMA session, he started realizing that even though his legal defense had been that this was an accident, even though that was his lawyer's case, that was what he told himself, now he's out of prison, he realized that maybe this wasn't entirely an accident. Wow. Maybe a part of him had wanted to kill his father. And that was so difficult for him that he said, I can't go further in this therapy. I have to stop. Mm -hmm. Now, because it's a protocol, we do three MDMA sessions three to five weeks apart, more or less one month apart. Okay. If this was normal therapy, post-approval, we would tell this person, take as long as you need to integrate this, to think mm -hmm. about it. You don't have to come back next week for another, next month for another MDMA session. It could be that it could be three, four months before he's ready to do another one. So I'm just saying that you can get re-traumatized even if you're in a therapeutic situation in part because the protocol requires a certain number of repeat sessions within a limited amount of time. But, but even if that's not the case, people sometimes need a lot of time to really process and integrate what comes up. And what we try to say to people is that you're not really ready for the next MDMA session until you've integrated what happened in the first session, at yeah, least to some yeah. significant effect. Yeah. So Rick, we're almost out of time. And then um, Dick Schwartz is gonna join us on the hour. <laughs> Great, great, great. Yeah. So yeah. I'll just to prepare you for yeah, the last thoughts or oh. things we didn't cover you want to address. Yeah. Um, just to say that the um, information that the, the, that what we've learned from uh, MDMA therapy for PTSD is that it validates the theories of IFS. Okay. We see people spontaneously talking about their parts, talking all the time. A part oh. of me is this, a part of me is that. They don't use the language of protectors and firefighters. Exiles, but, or, yeah. But they use the language of parts all the time. It's wow. a spontaneous thing. So I'd say that the main MDMA therapy has really um, validated the, the theories of IFS. Wow. IFS. Oh, the other quick thing I'll say is I see this, sure. didn't the Concord prison experiment in the 60s reveal reduced recidivism with LSD? Uh, first off, the answer is no. That was with psilocybin, not LSD, but Timothy Leary committed scientific fraud. I did a 34-year 30 30 year, follow-up to that study. So if you go to the maps.org website and you go to my bio, there's a link to the follow-up study to the Concord Prison Experiment. And so I did it believing that it was a very successful study and it reduced recidivism. Um, but what happened was, and I know that you're running out of time, but I'll be very quick, which is that... Um, Near the end of the experiment, what Leary and Metzner and others realized is that you cannot just rely on a psychedelic experience to, to have an effect. It was over-reliance on this uh, one dose magical cure or several doses magical cure that you needed halfway, you needed support, you needed integration for these people. And they had mm -hmm. set that up after um, people had released from prison, but that's right around the time they got kicked out of Harvard and then it fell apart. Right. So I'd say what the study showed is that um, psychedelic experiences by themselves are not enough to reduce recidivism, that Leary fudged the data, but that the experiment still needs to be done where you combine psychedelic experiences, uh, pro-social, reducing trauma with aftercare. And then I think we could do a lot in uh, reducing recidivism. So. All of that is That's just like beautiful. to say, more information on maps.org. We're funded by donations. So if you wanted to donate, that would be appreciated. And thank you, Soren, for this opportunity. Thank you, Rick. It's so good to see you. And so you're always just a wealth of information. Thank you for your 40 years of steadfast focus on this. And congratulations on the progress and wishing you the very best as you jump over the next hurdle and the next hurdle and the next <laughs> hurdle. Not yeah. many people have that long-term commitment that you have. So deep yeah. out of you.